The topic in this room today is state, state Trojans, not the kind of Trojans that criminals install. We have companies that do this professionally and more or less legally. State Trojans shouldn't actually be built because if they do get built, they will re get to the wrong into the wrong hands. And how we can use our court system and our legal system to get this onto a proper path, properly organized according to the rule of law, that will be explained by Ulf Burmeier now, who has been a legal given legal support to many club issues. And also we have uh, Thorsten Schröder, uh, who has been watching this topic for a long time as well and has looked at what's actually inside the FinFisher software. Have a huge applause, please, for Ulf Burmeier and Thorsten Schröder. Right. Hi. Nice that you're all here. Welcome. Hi, hi. Welcome to Finn Fisher. See you in court. If uh, one or other of you knows this, an American organization said, see you in court to Donald Trump when he illegally tried to prevent migration to the United States, immigration. And we are dealing with the exact opposite, the uh, migration out of Germany of evil software and short historical review, a look back. Don't worry, this is not going to be a terrible legal talk. Thorsten will make sure of that. But this will be about a further chapter in the fight against digital vermin. And this will be a very specific form of digital vermin. Right, state Trojans, which a few years ago we did talk about in Congress already, software that states use against criminals, op opponents, and so on. Torsten's already said this is a topic which has been keeping the club and myself busy for a few years. This photo is from the 25th Chaos Con Communication Congress, 11 years ago, that is, because there was good news from Karlsruhe, where the Federal Constitution Court is in Germany. You may remember that the court in 2008 defined a new basic right and that is the right that we know today as the computer basic rights or in <laughs> more clever speak the right to integrity and confidentiality of IT systems a term which only people that have been studying law for far too long can come up with and uh, when we did this talk uh, and went in front of that red curtain, we were hoping that this basic right could change things, but unfortunately it has to be said, it didn't. We found a state Trojan in 2011, which particularly violated that basic right, and maybe at the time the news hadn't reached the developers. That Trojan we had been given on a hard disk in, an, in a brown envelope and we analyzed it and wrote a very elaborate report and gave a talk at what was then 28 C3. These are our images when we were young and beautiful and that was the first time I was on the stage together with Ulf. It seems like we only share a stage when the topic is Tate Trojans, and I think I'm even wearing the same black pullover. Uh, yeah, we introduced the Tate Trojan, didn't only describe it, but also demonstrated how it violated that basic right by turning a computer into a bug and making it possible to surveil every section of someone's private residence and downloading stuff from it, that was maybe the most blatant violation and uh, because the law didn't quite say what a state version can or cannot do, it didn't prohibit it uh, overall, but it set up quite strict hurdles and the makers from the Digitask company didn't stick to those rules and they even wrote what you could term a remote control software for Windows. And this Tate Trojan's task was only to monitor eavesdrop on Skype and maybe listen and, and uh, find some chat messages, but it could do more, we found, much more. It could download further pieces of software, take screenshots, and 
screenshots of non-sent emails, draft emails, thoughts that you just type in, it could record and send as well. So that is exactly the scenario that we've been criticizing in the club over and over again. And unfortunately, this wasn't the end of the debate. As you could imagine, for a true zombie, state Trojans simply cannot be destroyed. And since 2017, we have another legal foundation for state Trojans, a new one in st uh, criminal procedural law. Uh, uh, the criminal police office has been allowed to use these for, for long uh, to prevent terrorism, to fight against terrorism. That's been in law for a while. But there's a new law now that in most criminal proceedings allows that state Trojans could be used which is why the Gesellschaft für Freiheitsrechte, the Society for Civil Rights, uh, has uh, fi filed a criminal complaint because, again, this state Trojan violates the Constitution and we're not only complaining about it not sticking to the limits that the Constitutional Courts has set up, but we ask, how could the Trojan actually enter someone's system? How can it be introduced? Am I in there already? as a famous TV ad for an early ISP went. So, which security vulnerabilities are kept open intentionally so that these Trojan could enter the system? It's only in exceptional cases that authorities have access to a device. In most cases, the Trojan has to be introduced from a remote location, and you need vulnerabilities, backdoors for that. And the minimal demand by the Society for Civil Rights is that they, that is just not on. If you have a legal foundation for state regions, you have to have clear rules wh which vulnerabilities could be used because otherwise there is a huge in incentive to keep backdoors secret and have all computers in the world remain unpatched. And not just German authorities, of course, are very interested and find state Trojan is very sexy. No, quite the opposite. The, this world map of Trojan use is remarkably red. At least as far as Finn Fischer is concerned, you see in this map that was made by Citizen Lab places where the software has been found or used. That, of course, is a nice thing that we in Germany can strive to find proper legal foundations. But if we can manage this, that, that if we get a proper foundation that protects privacy, that doesn't mean that we'll have got rid of the problem. No, quite the opposite. Uh, the thing is that we can assume that the software that's in, in use worldwide, as we can see, that that software is made in Germany, and that is the problem, made in Germany, but not only used in Germany, but across the whole world, in places where the rule of law maybe is not that intact, because, of course, it's very interesting to, to use state churches against people that, for good reasons, are in trouble with the state. This is José Eduardo dos Santos from Angola in southwest Africa, who seems to be on Finn Fischer's customer list, or Hamas, Hamad bin Isa al-Khalifa, who announced himself as the king of Bahrain, and regarding press freedom in, uh, in the index for press freedom in 2017, Bahrain is in a proud 164th place of 180 countries. So press freedom in this country means to write what the boss wants you to write. Bahrain is one of the least free countries in the world. Censorship and repressive legalization legislation, repressive legislations prevents free journalism. journalism. Journalists are under arrest. So that means that there are targeted attempts to hack people who uh, have a critical voice. But the problems begin at home, or very close to our own doorstep. Well, we also have, well, in, even in Europe or in places that want to join the European Union, we have people in power who have an issue with their own population and their political opposition in particular. And, well, um, there was a range of uh, political unrest, including um, an attempted military coup in Turkey in 2016. After that, Turkey has increasingly turned into uh, an increasingly repressive regime. Yeah. Yeah, after that failed um, 
military coup attempt. Um, more than 50,000 people were arrested. More than 140,000 people were removed from their positions of um, employment. Um, right now, Turkey has become the country which um, in the entire world uh, keeps the highest number of journalists in prison um, in relation, in proportion to the population size. Right now, there are at least 34 journalists who are under political arrests. Hundreds of journalists and media organizations were closed down. That's very, um, very obvious. Um, that often people really try to p repeatedly point out that these people are suspected of being terrorists. Basically, if you're in the wrong, pl wrong place at the wrong time, you are a terror suspect immediately and can be arrested and put into prison. Luckily, despite all repression, at least in Turkey, there is still a political opposition. For instance, um, you can see in this picture, in the summer of 2017, members of the opposition went out onto the streets under the motto Adalet, um, to protest against the Turkish government. However, after that, the Turkish secret service or intelligence service had a particularly insidious idea because protests against the big master, that's absolutely unacceptable. Hence, the intelligence service created a website online, which, as you can see here in the picture, um, at first sight looks like it may have been created by, the organiza by an opposition organization. Um, so it looks a bit like that with the logo and the picture, as if this was being run by, picture, by people who support the protests. And on this website, which might look like a protest-based website, um, there was a really nice button on the lower right, which looks like you're going to the Google Play Store if you click on it. However, if you click on this button, you can download an Android software, um, an APK file, and it's being offered for download in this particular instance. It was there for several weeks. Um, but the problem is, as you may suspect, this wasn't a messenger app or some kind of calendar app that the opposition may have used to organize themselves. But in reality, this APK was a Android Trojan, which we identified, uh, which we will continue to describe as the Adalet Trojan in, from, here on, from here on. So the question is, where does this Trojan come from? Where did it come from? We believe based on what we have know right now, that this Turkish Trojan that was used against this movement in Turkey came from Germany. And we have invested an enormous amount of time to prove this and show you evidence for why we suspect that this is the case. As you can imagine, Anna Bizeli said this very nicely two days ago. Um, if um, there is a tra if there is a trow somewhere, the, the swine and the pigs aren't far away. So if someone is waving around with dollar bundles, then there will be. If, if you have a dictator who's waving around money, there will be companies not far away who are willing to sell them something, regard human rights, whatever. Um, one of those institutions and uh, companies is Finn Fisher from Munich, which describes themselves as having being excellent in cyber investigation. Going up, going up against such producers of Trojans um, is difficult from a legal perspective because under particular conditions these Trojans can be used legally because the mere fact that they're creating Trojans, that in itself is not illegal, especially if German institutions, government institutions are also some of their customers. For instance, according to reporting by um, Netzpolitik.org, um, the German criminal Federal Criminal Police Office is also one of their customers. Um, similar, so, so is the Berlin police. But you cannot simply export Trojans to other places because they're considered cyber weapons. Um, so there are restrictions on the export of Trojans. It's not generally banned, um, but they're on a list of export uh, of export controlled products because before so before you export a Trojan, you need a permission from the German government. Um, there are only a few countries that are exempted from this a need for a permission that, it, that it's mostly EU countries and a few others. In the case of Adalet, this was a really nice case because the Turkish government is using a Trojan against their political opposition. Um, there was already some trouble with the Turkish government and this Trojan is apparently of, out of all places from Germany and the export of Trojans from Germany to Turkey was illegal because there was no permission, at least according to the German government. So for us, in this case, which was Netzpolitik.org, which is a German publication, um, and the Society for Civil Rights, an NGO, that this is a case um, for the uh, state attorney, for the public prosecutor's office. So we filed a complaint against the 
illegal export of cyber weapons. And we worked with uh, uh, Reporters Without Borders, Netspolitik.org, and the ECCHR, the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights, and we joined up to submit a criminal complaint and submitted it this summer to achieve that the people who were responsible at Finfisher for uh, this export of this Trojan are being held accountable. Because we think just as German weapons shouldn't be used to murder people in the entire world, German Trojans shouldn't be used to suppress human rights in the, in the rest of the world or even in Turkey. So here's a timeline and an overview. So this is the timeline for our criminal complaint, or rather when the sample, um, that's what we talk about when we get um, some of the code from such an APK or a malware. We got that in June, it was spread in June 2017. So that was well after the guideline for expert restrictions was introduced. It's very obvious that the target group were opposition mem members of the opposition in Turkey. That was very obvious based on the website. And as Ulf already said, um, we sent a request to the German government, which confirmed that at least in this time between 2015 and 2017, there were no no expert permissions for Finfisher in this re like in this direction. At least for us, it was clear that this was this was enough for a criminal complaint. Obviously, we needed to investigate the facts a bit further, but at the very least, it was sufficient um, to notify the prosecutor's office of this case. And we have a range of pieces of evidence um, that this case is being taken very seriously. In September 2019, we published this criminal complaint. Amongst other things, on netspolitik.org, which is a German publication that reports on internet politics, and we can very much assume that the people who run Finfisher are not very happy about this, because they um, used illegal means to make netspolitik.org take that article down. But luckily, they had been getting so many; they got a range of donations and a large amount of donations. So I hope that it won't make won't create financial profit for the people who sue them. But I heard that there are maybe archive-type websites uh, on the internet, so you can read the article in its entirety on those types of websites. So Finfisher um, and their friends are hitting back what we think that people who are the dogs who are hit essentially um, try to defend themselves. So we asked for the we asked the Chaos Computer Club to look at the evidence we've collected against Finfisher so far, to look at it very closely to see whether there might not be additional evidence. Um, the aim of this mission is to essentially create further evidence that we have necessary evi evidence for a like a complaint based on the uh, for the law that uh, essentially restricts illegal that re restricts illegal exports from the German external economy law. I'll spare you the legal details. Um, it's pretty complex in detail, but it basically um, this references another um, external economy law where there is a list of particular goods um, for starting from, a, from regular tanks all the way to a state Trojan, and this is a list of goods that you can only export if you have a permission, and we think that this is the law that Finn Fischer broke. So, we asked the Chaos Computer Club to take a very deep, uh, detailed look at this Trojan and ask the two facts that have huge legal implications. And that is, one, first, the time that the Trojan was made, which is relevant when it is about finding, when you want to find whether the software was made after the deadline in mid-2015, I think. Uh, yes, exactly. So if you can prove that the software was only made after that time, then we can assume that it was only exported afterwards as well. And the qu second important question was, if we take a very neutral approach, who produced this sample? It, there is initial evidence, uh, initial, there are initial clues that this was uh, Finn Fischer, but that, had to, uh, that would have to be clarified. So we asked the Chaos Computer Club, and they had a look, they took a look, and we had previous analysis. People have looked at Finn, Finn Spy samples, 
And these analyses were the starting point for you, weren't they? Yes. We said that, yes, could you take a look at these previous existing analyses first? Uh, from Citizen Lab, for example, they did this, not just for Finn Fisher products, but also others. And the issue was to check whether this is all plausible, whether the findings could be reproduced, and whether you could summarize it in a way that German investigating authorities could use them legally. And we obtained an expertise from, we looked at expertises written by others. There is a certain plausibility check there from 2018 from a company and in 2018 Access Now published a report summarizing the current state of knowledge and for the criminal complaints there was a technical analysis in particular about uh, of this Adalet sample, the actual subject of the whole complaint. And we looked at all those documents and saw whether there were any gaps that needed to be filled, whether things should be described in more detail, and that was the main work that, you, that we ultimately had to do. If you expect that it was a, this was this completely groundbreaking new evidence about these two Trojans, then sorry, I'd have to disappoint you. We found, we verified a lot of work that other, other people did, and we found some new clues that seem much more grave than what has been said so far. And I think you did find some very interesting technical details that we will come to. For example, the provisioning, how does the Trojan get adapted? That was a very interesting technical detail. So then, the day before, uh, yesterday it was, uh, yesterday you published the CCC's analysis. Yes, we published it yesterday so that we had some material that we could refer to if time allows for the Q&A maybe, and we wrote a, an in-depth report where we also evaluate and, and weigh up what we found and come to some conclusions. So um, what we found very important in the work is that we published everything. In contrast to the other organizations that did invest a lot of work, we published all the samples on GitHub. There is a link afterwards, there will be one. There will be um, all the tools we used are in that repository and the intermediate results, intermediary results we found. And the objective here was that everyone should be able to reproduce our results. We have the samples, you have the samples, you have the tools that we used for that 60-page report. And you can just look at those conclusions and see how we think. And we have really wrote a comprehensive summary. and. Uh, the commission, of course, you cannot really commission the CCC, and in particular, the Society of Civil Rights did not pay the Computer Case Computer Club. That's an important thing to say. It's not a commissioned expertise. We just ask if you found this interesting, then please take a look. And I do believe that it's great that the CCC, in the person of Torsten here, has taken the time to do this. So to briefly summarize, this was the commission, analyze, verify, close gaps, uh, in the chain of clues and uh, perform some targeted analysis of further samples and find out when the Adalet Trojan that was used in Turkey was made and second, where does it actually come from? And these here are a whole number of samples and we can see that this listing that we analyzed these are the original original malware files that uh, are part of the Trojan. This is all in that GitHub repository by Linus Neumann, who I did the whole analysis with. Thanks again to Linus. We spent several nights with this 
fantastic Trojan. <laughs> and as you say, these Trojans were used in Turkey, uh, in Myanmar, and Vietnam. Uh, it's not that, regardless of where, well, well, there are some clues about where it was used. Regarding Turkey, it's quite easy to say because we had this website which was targeted against these groups and also there are samples where we can be quite sure that they were used in Myanmar because a very well-known Burmese ocean platform was used. So the name was used to spread the sample and that of course is a very clear indication that uh, it was targeted against this population. About Vietnam, I'm not so sure. The attribution there is, it, it's generally a difficult thing and it's also quite difficult to see where it was used because all the metadata that you can find in the samples, IP addresses, phone numbers and all that, they don't, they're not hard evidence and we'll talk about that more, but let's start with the important question, when was the sample produced? And you spent quite a lot of time thinking about this question and the central question was, when was it actually made? We looked at these samples and saw, looked for indications that the software may have been made after 2015. There are various ways of trying to find that. In general, what we see in these binaries and, and these malware samples, that is the earliest possible time. If I can prove that a component of the software was only made in May 2016 or published at the time, then that does mean that the whole software sample in overall can only have been made after that time. So we can prove the earliest possible time. And it could be possible that it was only made in 2017, but no earlier than 2016 for sure. So when a library is, has been published and used, it cannot have been made before the library was published. So we were looking for German compiler artifacts, certain strings that uh, open source products contain, but then these APK files, the Android app files, are distributed as APK. That is technically nothing but a zip archive, which most of you will probably know. And within these archives, you can find certificates about the developers that have published this. And with those certificates, you can look at a timestamp for when the certificate was issued. That for, from a legal point of view, is not very hard evidence because a certificate can ha can be given any timestamp you want. You can say, I'm, I'll go back in time or I'll date it into the future. That's all possible. But why should you do that? Well, maybe there is a good reason. And for that, because of that issue, we looked at samples that went all the way back to 2016. We looked at those APKs for the Trojan from 20 that came went public between 2012 and 2019. So when you have a sample of 2019 with uh, something that was used in the past as well, then you can ask whether this is plausible or not. And also there are public there's public documentation uh, which is first the sample itself which we obtain from the internet, from various sources. Um, but it's important, therefore, that all the 28 samples that we had should be looked at and you should ask when the individual sample was made. And one clue was the time that a certain library was made. And here you can see the disassembly of a shared object that was uh, d uh, delivered. So this Android applications are actually just Java applications. So there's Java bytecode in that. And in Java, you have the op option to use the Java native interface to access other code that was perhaps provided by the operating system or written in C, other programming languages that are also part of the delivery. And in that sample, we found a shared object file that 
in Linux operating system is has the ex extension SL and under Windows they have the extension DLL, dynamic loadable libraries and there was the library a library there in which we found certain strings that seemed to say that this was only made into that can only have been made in 2016. We can see this uh, because it's SQLite that is an open source database application and in the compiled file it leaves this string which is a date, a timestamp and a hash. And if you look at the hash and see when does this string appear for the first time, you can go to the website of that open source project and find that this version of SQLite is version 3.13 and that it was published in May 2016 and you can see that very checksum with the exact same string. So you can very confidently, 100% confidently say that no one came up with the idea in 2012 to write this. That is quite unlikely. Uh, I hope I'm not going to laser into your eyes. Um, and then you were looking at those certificates with which the software was signed, right? Yes, we did that as well, and uh, the other researchers did that too. Of course, they worked in much the same way, but we did want to analyze the analyses as well. So uh, for completeness, we included that in our report, and we, we included a timeline. There's a nice table to up to uh, upcoming, and you can see the output here of the certificate that the developer used to sign the piece of software. You can see that it was produced in October 2016, so it fits the picture. If you assume that the certificate was made when the sample was built, and that is after May 2016, uh, the question how long it is valid doesn't really matter, but it would now be very nice what would we get if we backdate this? What would we then get if we backdate it? That would be nice. We could then mislead researchers. If we would state that the certificate was produced in 2012, there would not, would not be much that we could say. But what will be relevant later, there are these fingerprints as well for the certificates. That's these, these long SHA values here. That's a cryptographic hash. Uh, calculated across the certificate and that is a unique value. So if you go to those 28 samples and look at all those certificates, we compare these SHA values, values as well because that is the, the fingerprint expresses it quite well. If we find this exact fingerprint in another sample then we can at least say that both samples Regardless whether then, regardless when they were produced, come from the same maker, and that is quite important evidence for the conclusions that we'll draw. But these two aspects that you mentioned, the libraries and the certificates, can lead to the conclusion that the Adelaide sample was not made before the 18th of May 2016, because the SQLite library wasn't published before that. That is such important, such hard evidence that we can confidently say that it was not made before that date. So that date is after the coming into force of the export controls. So this sample, if it really was exported into Turkey, would violate foreign trade law. And second aspect, maybe even more important, what is the origin? What kind of being, what kind of creature is this Adelit creature? And uh, as we said, we collected samples across a wide time range and looked at what they have in common. How can you conclude that they come from the same source? And you don't have to care what the source is called, but it was important to see if there is a connection. So we, you looked at these code signing certificates. As I said, there are some other indications for this time issue, but that those are not so important at the moment. The coding style is important. As I said, these APKs are basically pro written in Java. So there are some shared object libraries as well that were developed with other languages, but you can 
decompile the Java code and also disassemble those libraries and uh, obtain an insight into a certain coding style. You can look at variable names, uh, see if obfuscation that was used on the code. Uh, so code origin and code tr structure could be concealed that way if it was used. The code base could be compared. Functionality are the features of one application. The functionality is that present in the other sample as well, in the other application that we had in 2014 and 2017 and so on. So we can compare these things and, and notice di differences as well as uh, things in common and therefore observe the evolution of that software. And we took great care in looking for language, native languages of those developers. And you can see that in some places, you can, quite see, you can see that quite clearly in some places. And you can also look when and how they were provisioned, whether there were similarities. Provisioning means that the Trojan was adapted for the specific use. So that Trojan is basically standard software, at least used in many cases, but for every single country, different parameters were set. And we come to that as well. And the interesting thing here is that these are parallels between different samples. So you can then possibly say that these samples come from the same source, but that doesn't say what source that is, what the kitchen was, where it was made. And the second step, therefore, is to find samples of confirmed origin. If you see that samples are coming from the same source, and at least one of the samples can be traced to a particular maker in a confirmed way, then you have a very high probability that the other samples come from that origin as well, from the same production line, that is. And we are very grateful there for very grateful to Phineas Fischer, who had a larger amount of, who carried a large amount of stuff out from that company and, and published it, a file with many, many samples. Thank you, Phineas Fischer. In other words, for this analysis, it was really advantageous that there were particular samples that came from this Phineas Fisher hack and that we could attribute with a high degree of confidentiality to Finn Fisher because of all this evidence that there was. So we kind of had have two anchoring points um, and we can use those anchoring points as the basis for a comparison of further samples and go further and further with that. But obviously that doesn't change anything about the fact that attribution is hard. So obviously we're still looking for further clues that might us point to us towards the person who created, or the entity that created this. So for example, in cases where um, the German parliament was hacked, often in many cases someone says it was the Chinese, it was the Russians, but that's very hard. Um, this, obviously we have to do the attribution to some degree, but we really use the clues and the context that we have uh, with regards to, for example, where the sample was used, such as Alalet in Turkey. And yeah. Obviously, it's also possible to fake something like this. For instance, if I say I'm part of a hacking group or maybe I'm a rival of Finn Fisher, maybe I want to portray them in a bad light, want to make them look bad, and so I might fake their malware um, and implement a false flag act um, activity. I mean, that's hard, but we think in these cases it's quite unlikely. And something like this, you could theoretically fake it. Oh, yeah, no, you can definitely fake it. But what we can see here um, is the processed uh, outcome of such a configuration, one of these provisions. As Ulf mentioned, um, these uh, individual samples are not being compiled individually every single time. There are basic parameters which are being used for each case that are necessary. And then this is one of these configurations that are being used for compilation. And it says, for example, oh, well, the proxy for calling home is this IP address or maybe this host name. And in a different place, you can see a part target ID, which is called Adalet, which is with what whoever um, built this Trojan came up with. Then there are several phone numbers where you can send texts or that you can call. And so in this case, you can see quite obviously 
that this attribution is hard because this IP address is in Germany, um, the phone number is uh, from Israel, and the other phone number is an international uh, reusable phone number. So that's not super obvious. There are no strong hints that it was definitely being used by Turkish government institutions. With regards to the family of the samples that you looked at, it looks slightly different because you can use the certificate that was used to sign these samples. Yeah, there so are a few indications that we got from this certificate um, based on which we essentially summarized samples as part of different groups as like things that definitely belong together and things that definitely don't belong together. Um, this list looks very confusing. One thing that is marked as green, that's the Adelaide sample that we're using as the basis for our analysis. So we want to find things that are similar. So everything in red um, has one parallel piece. All of that is uh, from the Phineas Fisher leak. Everything that's in yellow at the top was l published once in 2012. And so there are relevant analyses and several clues that it also is something that comes from Finn Fisher. So if we assume that all these red ones are from Finn Fisher because it was part of the leak from a Finn Fisher hack. Then we have here one sample that is 4 to 1 A and D. 4 to 1 seems to be the version number. A and D seems to refer to Android. And we can tell that this fingerprint of the certificate that I mentioned earlier and that I was explaining earlier, that we can find this fingerprint um, in a different sample from two years earlier. So in two years earlier, Samples were leaked that had exactly the same fingerprint. And so at the top we have this typo, Andrea, that's one of their typos. So maybe that was that seems to have been some kind of demo sample. In that case, the company apparently was trying to show to someone and demonstrate what this Trojan can do. And so they provisioned it with a dip Dif different websites and had some server URLs that was at the same time, at, at the time pointed towards Gamma International. But at, in addition to that, we they also used the certificate to sign a sample in the wild, um, this one called DRISE, which was identified in Vietnam, and which was also referencing German, uh, Vietnamese IP addresses and phone numbers. Attribution is hard, but in that case, we can definitely say that this demo sample and this in the wild sample are definitely from the same place by using this certificate's fingerprint. Yeah, and the next step you did is that you were looking at the structure of these individual samples, um, in particular how this software works um, from a logical progression. Um, so yeah, we were looking at different functions and we looked at what different functions does this file have. So we were also looking at their coding style, which type of types of variables were they using. For example, when you can look at non-obfuscated Java code, the, what we can see here, there are two different samples. One is from the 2014 leak. That's also some kind of demo version. And then the 2016 version. So, I, well, I say 2016 because it was definitely written after 2016 with the Adalet sample. And so we did some. We did a refactoring here, where we renamed all the variables and the different na and the different functions. But it's definitely one very much the same, one of the same function. That's very obvious once you look at the co code. But I didn't want to show you the source code, um, which is why I did a call flow based on the source source code that I'm showing you here. That's a f um, function called run in the 2014 sample. This is um, under a class called S SMS. Um, in the Adalet sample, it's under um, a function called SIMS, which was written in Leadspeak. And one thing we can tell, ver see very clearly that this function basically executes exactly the same code with some marginal changes and differences. At least in our opinion, that can't be a coincidence. So we think that's essentially a further evolution of the samples from 2012 and 2014 and now 2016. So that's the evolution. That's the um, information that we could gain from looking at these. In addition to that, you can also draw conclusions from this piece of lead speak. Because if you think, well, the term SMS is a very typical German thing, um, you may understand it in other contexts where people uh, but might not use it. Um, at least in Germany, it refers to text, text but in other places, you um, use different terms. Um, but in, especially if you start thinking of the German term Simsen, which is a German term for to text that's extremely typically German. And I really can't imagine that a German, uh, the Turkish programmer might 
might suddenly start talking about Zimsen, such as a German programmer might. Um, yeah, and I also especially can't imagine that someone who speaks English might not do it. Um, this is a term that used to be very modern, um, and it was even included in the German uh, lexico like German lexicon of reference. So it's very difficult to imagine that someone who is not a German native speaker w might or would use this term as part of their code, especially with regards to the context of catching um, catching texts and in the context, and then is even trying to obfuscate it with um, lead speak. But you also found another piece of obfuscation that was especially smart. Um, at least I thought I was really impressed when I read this analysis, which is with regards to how this data, these parameters that we were talking up, this data for provisioning was saved in these virus files or was hidden there. Yeah, in that case, the developer came up with a uh, cover channel, which is something that is similar to st steganography, um, where you're hiding um, information in different data structures in an automated way, so you cannot really recognize it with, by just looking at it with your bare eyes. So what types of configurations do you have to hide here? For instance, I was talking about these phone numbers that are being called or that you can send text to, these IP addresses um, that the malware is connecting with, um, so it can connect with the, co the control and command server, can control the software, um, how long the measure is going to run, all of this is information that is saved in this APK somehow, and it has to be saved in there somehow. And one thing that you noticed when you were looking at the samples is that all of them were using exactly the same procedure for this. That's exactly the same procedure. Yeah, we didn't even discover this. Um, others discovered this, such as um, Josh Kunzweig in a blog entry in 2012 already wrote about this, who was analyzing those FinSpy samples. So it's not something incredibly cutting edge, um, but at least we can show and we can watch this procedure being used across these seven years in all of these samples, which also, and also since it's not kind of a standard measure or procedure that you can find in malware a lot, we can basically assume that this technology really originated from the same developer, which means that all of these samples, these 28 samples that we had, that they probably come from the same place. So what does this look like? So this is the the top of the file. No, so these are the APK, as I mentioned, is basically just a zip archive. And this zip archive includes and contains metadata on the data that it included in the archive itself. And so there you have these uh, the central directory structure with p d different fields. So here you have the header, which has different byte and bit fields, which are defined, and which essentially define the attributes of files that are included in this archive and describing the attributes of these files. One really important piece of metadata that you can use to transport data without being detected too easily are file system attributes. So, for example, this zip specification um, essentially assumes that you use 36-byte um, th for, in for internal signatures um, and for uh, attributes in the target system. So, uh, because of, so, hence we have six bytes per central directory structure, which you can use to hide data. Because, of course, you can write completely idiotic file attributes, which is what they did. So, if you're unzipping these files on the target system, they don't make any sense anymore. But they don't have to, because you're not using th this data. These are only dummy files. Um, here you can see it in the hex editor. You can say th see this APK, and you can see the structure. You have the signature, this PK zip signature that's in yellow at the very beginning um, and then you have an offset of a 36 byte later you have these six bytes of file attributes and if you know anything about Unix file, file systems you can tell immediately that this is not a regular bit field for attributes that make any kind of sense instead what you see here are base 46 encoded files and so uh, base 64 encoded um, and so if you parse this and you look at all of these signatures and then you, you put these file attributes together and then you decode the final string 
you base 64 decode this entire string, then you get a binary file that basically is exactly the configuration of the sample of this malware and contains this malware's configuration. As I said, that's something that someone has already documented previously. Um, we basically just went over this again and used this technique and checked for the entirety of the samples. So in a first step, we had to extract the files. And then in a second step, we have to parse these files. And the tool for doing this is also on the GitHub. Um, so you don't have to believe us that this is the case, um, but you can just check for yourself and download this file um, and run it, this tool and run it over the, the samples because we hope that maybe you can use this to analyze further samples. And this is an overview of something like that looks like in its entirety. And I think we have to jump a bit to see where we continue. Yeah, here. So that's one of these configurations as it looks like in its entirety. So this is the Indriot example, which is from 2012, which was already uploaded to Virus Total in 2012. And as you can see, you have these host names that already include the host name. But I obviously also have to say that this is not doesn't have a lot of evidentiary power, because if you just find these um, the, these chains, because Josh Kunzweig, who already said in 2012 and already published a tool on GitHub, which we, you can use to um, create such a configuration and insert it into such an APK. So basically, this means that you could also fake something like this. So the piece of evidence that we get is not um, what is written in these hidden files of configuration, um, but all samples are using the same strategy and the same proprietary strategy, which is pretty smart to hide the files in the APK file. Um, and the similarity is basically the main result from this analysis, because all samples that you looked at are using this proprietary mechanism. And uh, But you're also saying that the format was developed further and evolved. Yeah. So it looks like that if you look at the content of this binary file, um, they're using some kind of directory to attribute to um, attribute different functions and names to different files, and that's something that makes it easy to parse this fi this this file because and to look at it to see uh, to figure out which values mean what, and so these values are, for example, this. Um, so, for instance, um, in the Adelaide sample, we had um, different values. Um, that do, don't necessarily point towards Turkey. Um, from the same time, there is a Flash 28, sa 28 sample, which had large similarities with the Adelaide sample, which, for example, is using a proxy from New Zealand, but they are still using the same uh, Israeli phone number. And then the Derice sample, as I mentioned, um, has all these values that are pointing towards Vietnam. So the proxy, the phone for texting, the call, call phone. Um, whether that means anything, I don't know. But at least um, we also published all the configs that we extracted on GitHub. GitHub and you can find it um, on Linus's uh, FinSpy documentation, where we also published our report and all these samples. And so maybe there's someone who wants to look at these phone numbers, maybe someone knows about them from other contexts. I think there are different interesting conclusions we might be able to draw from that, so we would be really interesting to hear something like that. So this is kind of like the overview of the samples that you analyzed. <laughs> So you, I think you can, you can already tell that there is something like a family resemblance. Um, we think the one that's um, somewhat different is this one, which we just called container because it doesn't have a different name, which is an APK that has no parallels to the others at all. But this one sample is different from the others in the sense that um, we included it here nevertheless. Um, it drops and essentially inc puts um, a malware somewhere. And so in this gray sample, there is a there's a root kernel exploit against a Unix kernel on Android devices. And they are uh, the, uh, using a vulnerability known as Dirty Cow to, get, to become root on the phone. And they also have several tools to stay root for the entire time frame. And so there's a, another sample called PF app. I don't know how to pronounce that, but that's the one that we assume was used in a, a Burmese context, which because PF is a very well-known um, social media network in the, the region. And the answer from a technical perspective, we've basically said most of these things already, but um, in conclusion, 
in, in summary, well, as I said, they're using all samples that we looked at are using the same proprietary mechanism for, for provisioning. All these extracted configurations exist in a very particular binary format. That is not something that is commonly used. So that definitely has to come from the same place. Um, there's also large similarities with regards to the Java code that they use. Um, there are also indications that it's f from somewhere in Germany. We can also say that the Adelet sample was created at the very earliest in the year 2016. And the samples from 2012 to 2014 can also be uniquely attributed to the company Finfisher. So, in conclusion, we think it can be said pretty clearly that all of these samples that we're looking at, we're looking at from 2012 to 2019 um, can likely be attributed to the group or the company Finfisher. And all of this you can read up on in detail in the study by the CCC, which was published yesterday. And as I said earlier, we also really want these to exist and we want to publish them in English. So we also put a pad for an English translation onto this file, and this uh, link, this pad doesn't exist yet, And but this can be turned into a raw translation. We would like to crowdsource this translation because it's quite a bit of work. And so we ourselves can't just translate this ourselves during Congress, but here is the URL where we will crowdsource this uh, this report and then of course check the facts um, obviously um, our NGO will also check the facts and, and we assume that the prosecutor's office will do that as well but we really appreciate the fact that the CCC published all the tools for the analysis and all the files that they used for the analysis so you don't just have to believe them but you can uh, read essentially check their analysis yeah transparency is incredibly important and so just um, uh, just hello to the German prosecutor's office. You obviously also have access to these files in the newest version. Um, and maybe you can also have a look at it. Um, and we're always open for pull requests. This is since the, the uh, German criminal federal criminal office also bought the Trojan from Finfischer. So a pull request from Wiesbaden or Berlin, that would be interesting. You can use Tor as well, that's fine, we're open towards any of these things. Um, and, the, um, and the Berlin uh, criminal office, uh, state criminal office also has a file, well, they could also have a look at that. So what does this mean for the criminal complaint? Yeah, from the so, uh, civil society, society for civil rights uh, perspective and the club perspective, uh, we have no doubt that the German Finnish uh, Trojan was used against the Turkish opposition. We are convinced that somehow this Trojan has, have, has, have, has to have made its way from Munich into the hands of the Turkish authorities and the violations against f foreign trade uh, law it has not expired yet, so the ball is now in the court of the Munich prosecutors for the, because the question is how exactly has the Trojan reached Turkey? We cannot prove that this certain agent with a black <laughs> suitcase uh, went somewhere and flew somewhere. That's what the prosecuting authorities would have to investigate. But as we said, we filed the criminal complaint and the prosecutors have all the means to find it out and we are convinced that they will use all means possible because it's clear that human rights cannot only be violated, use, violated using Kalashnikovs but also through straight Trojans and that has to be finished. Thanks a lot. Yes, a huge thanks. We have a little time left. One minute. This is your applause. Great. We unfortunately have no more time for questions. At the very beginning, before this talk, I mentioned that there is C3 post, and the speakers have mentioned that at the 28 C3 they received a hard disk. Uh, surely it was delivered in different ways, but I am the postman today and I can deliver a package to you. Oh, this is yours, okay. Only open after the talk. Thanks very much indeed. Yeah, and thanks for listening to the translation. Please give us feedback on Twitter using the hashtag C3T or on Mastodon. Um, this was uh, Whitey Chan and Sibylis. Thanks a lot for listening. You can also email us at hello at c3lingo.org. Um, so if you're listening to this, please let us know what you thought.